This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Hey, I want to tell listeners about a special offer from Steam. Steam is offering an exclusive 100 euro discount to listeners of When Science Speaks. Just put in the coupon code STEAM SPEAKS, S T E M S P E A K S, STEAM SPEAKS, when you register for Steam Summer School. This code will last all the way up until registration closes. So I hope you will take advantage of this special offer for When Science Speaks listeners to get 100 euros off the tuition for STEAM's summer program on the island of Malta. Additional information will be in the show notes as far as how to access that uh, information and a link to STEAM Summer School. Well, hey, everyone. It's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists get funding, gain influence, and build strategic relationships with their most important stakeholders. Achieving these goals often involves effective translation of complicated research into engaging jargon-free communication that boils down complex topics to capture the attention of decision makers and general audiences. Interested in getting a free resource to do just that? Go to complexitymadeclear.com to get the 11 keys for translating complexity. That's complexitymadeclear.com to get your free infographic used by science communicators at major organizations to boil down, but not dumb down, complicated science and technical topics for key stakeholders. I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Edward Duca and Amanda Matheson to the show today. Edward Duca is a science and innovation communication lecturer at the University of Malta co-runs the science communication STEAM summer school and is involved in several large EU funded projects, as well as having created and managed several science communication events through the NGO, the Malta Chamber of Scientists. The largest activity of that opportunity is the National Science and Art Festival called Science in the City, which attracts 6% of Malta's population annually. And I need to put that on the bucket list, Ed, as something that I must attend. At some point, Ed has recently been appointed as Rector's Delegate for STEM Popularization Engagement and EU SEA board member. His aim is to continue developing transdisciplinary research and activities to develop evidence for the effective communication of research that will encourage a scientifically aware society leading towards an informed democracy and active citizenship. So important. Ed wants to embed a culture of public engagement and research that benefits society. Amanda Matheson has an undergraduate degree in plant science and a master's in science communication, both from the University of Manchester. She has worked in a number of universities around Europe, engaging the public with science through the arts, and currently works at Biorbic, a bioeconomy research center based in University College Dublin. Her specialty is theatrical STEM escape rooms that explore science through exciting puzzles. That is really cool. Amid. I feel like <laughs> earth is like an escape room at this point. We're yeah. trying to figure it out. <laughs> Welcome to the show, guys. So fantastic to have you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So I'm going to try and really enunciate my words because I'm well aware that my accent is pretty strong and from the Northeast, so may not translate to American audiences. So yeah, if I'm fumbling my words, then please let me know and I'll speak more clearly. No problem. I can understand <laughs> you perfectly, and I love your accent. I know oh, thank you. Will be into it too. <laughs> the SEAM Summer School that you lead, it's located in Malta, of course. It provides practical training in communicating science through the arts. What can you tell listeners about the program? And of course, we're going to link to the website that will be included in the show notes that accompany this episode. Amanda, maybe you could lead us off. Yeah, great. So uh, STEAM is a nine-day course hosted in person in Malta, and the goal is to train adults in how they can communicate science through the arts. So over the nine days, participants will design an event, usually a science theatre event, 
and they'll promote it. They'll deliver it in front of a real audience and they'll also evaluate it. And the stage of this process, we're there to demonstrate how that's done. So for example, we'll do some activities around targeting audiences, and then the participants will decide what's their audience for their event. What's the theme going to be? We'll work on performance skills later in the course, and that's going to feed into their rehearsals and so on. So it's really about developing skills and putting them into practice straight away. It's usually a small group of around 12 to 15 people, which means lots of contact time. And we have all kinds of participants, really, from PhD students to assistant professors. We've had journalists, we've had teachers, and it's not just Europe as well. We have people come in from countries all around the world. We've had the US, we've had Brazil, Nigeria, South Korea, um, completely, yeah, random. Uh, and the reason I think we can have such a, a variety of participants is we've developed over the years this flipped classroom approach. So that means anybody who um, registers for the school, they'll automatically get access to our online course. And that is a series of modules, which provides a really brief introduction to several areas of science communication. So that's there basically for beginners or people who might feel they have some knowledge gaps to fill in. And it means that when we come to Malta, we're all on the same page. We don't have to waste time on lectures during the actual school because why travel all the way to Malta to sit in a lecture that you could have watched at home or even worse, it's something you already know. Um, so instead at the school, we focus purely on group activities, working with each other, developing skills, um, working closely with the facilitators and making real connections with people. Because I think one of the great things about STEAM is the network that comes out of it. And we've had people collaborate with each other after the school. We've had people find new job roles through their STEAM contacts. And we even had two people who met at STEAM and became a couple. Um, but yeah, you never know what might come out of one of our causes. So yeah. Ed, how would you, could you provide some of your perspectives on this too? Hi, Mark. STEAM is something that I really loved to develop. It's been started to talk six years ago now, and we're really passionate about continuing this, making it a, a sustainable thing, a financially sustainable thing, because we really believe in this approach and we've seen the fruits of it. As Amanda said, the people who have come, we've formed friendships with them. We've kept in touch. They've kept in touch with each other. They've gone on to do different things. And even Amanda herself, she started off like working for it and now is basically leading it because of the passion I think she feels for this approach also. And we've done theater, stand-up comedy, improv. The, the students have been really creative. They've even, even when we went online, they created a, a online treasure hunt based on science. It, it, the creativity coming when you challenge people in this way. And I always knew I was being very ambitious when I was telling people, okay, you're going to market, create do everything around an event. Initially, it was even multiple events. <laughs> but I think I was being a bit cruel and Amanda has brought a bit more sense and unity I think, in the program <laughs> because it's just one event. It, it, that's, that approach, I think, really, that challenge really brings people together and gets people out of their comfort zones. I'm remembering a friend of mine, he's an academic, came be part of the show and you really show, saw him come out, try comedy for the first time. And afterwards, actually, um, I think did a stand-up comedy show in Ireland. So that was really fantastic for us. Seeing this development of people, I think is the, is the most rewarding thing. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. I love that color that you both provided. And I just want you to think back, because as you mentioned, it's been six years since you started the program. What was the original impetus for getting it started? Okay, so it, it, it um, started off with me being a bit inebriated over a beer, a few glasses of beer with, at the Copenhagen Science Center. It's actually moved now from where it, it was. This was back in 2014. And I was talking to Professor Alexander Gerber and I, another um, scholar in science communication. And in our discussion, it was like, you know what the field really needs is a, is a summer school. It was like, okay, that's a challenge. It's a challenge. And I had another friend of mine from Greece. He does science theater in, in Greece, a whole network um, of tens of thousands of school children being trained using science and theater. He showed me the light in terms of EU funding. The EU is a fantastic place 
in terms of there are all these different funding pro programs that if you figure out the right language, the right approach, you can make the EU happy and it makes you happy back by you send in a 70 page or a hundred page or more document and they give you a lump. Uh, some of money to make that thing, that idea happen, which is quite incredible when you think about it. And so from the conversation by uh, Canal in Copenhagen, we ended up with this team's summer school. And in the kickoff, we were putting post-its all over the place. Uh, at that point, we had the European Network of Science Journalists, also their president, university in, in, in Finland, the University of Edinburgh, and Science View in Athens and Rydvall University, apart from the University of Malta. So I really aced team and, and we just tried to put what we thought were the most important things in science com communication in one, one program and also to make it as practical as possible. In the beginning, we were probably packing in too much and now we've reduced it, we've focused it, we've, we've, we've condensed it, but I, I, I think we really wanted to we saw that there were all these different programs happening. A lot of them were very like, okay, in a couple of days, we're going to teach you how to write or something. I, I don't feel that it really works. We really wanted to get pe people immersed in just enough theory and just to try things out, push themselves, experiment and get a real flavor of what effective science com communication is about. And we do emphasize things like evaluation and so on, or understanding if what you're doing actually works or not. And our goal was to build this uh, European wide network. And I think that's expanded to many different continents. Uh, we experimented with different venues, first we did it in Greece in in Germany, sorry, then in Greece, and that's when Amanda joined and, and then we've settled in Malta really. <laughs> um, I think our impetus was also to have fun. <laughs> I have fun whilst doing it. I think it's been a, a great experience. It, it, these kinds of things really change your life. It's quite incredible. That really gets to my next question. Thanks, Ed, for that. Amanda, you mentioned that there's also the, the flip classroom approach. So the theory, a lot of that can, can happen beforehand and that you can really focus on some of these performance skills that you mentioned. Scientists and journalists and, and others involved in scientific careers may not consider themselves as performers per se. From your perspective, why are performance skills so vital for effectively communicating science? Yeah, um, that's a good, really interesting question. And I personally think we are all performance simply through the fact that we communicate to different people. So if you imagine how you would speak to a small child is different to how you might behave at work. And that's different to how you might behave with your friends in a bar, for example. So communication really performance, it's not like you're different people in all of those environments, you're performing differently based on the environment you, you're in. And it's basically how you want to give an impression to people of this is who I am, this is what my intentions are. And you adapt your language to, to make yourself accessible to that audience and to make it appropriate to the right context. So I think we are all performers in, in these different scenarios and the kind of performance that scientists and journalists have become quite skilled at is the role of the expert or of the unbiased disseminator of information, if you like, which is great that performance can work well with some audiences, but with others, I don't think it works as well because both of those roles, if you think about them, they, they attention, intentionally take away the emotion and the humanity out of the equation. How do I deliver unbiased facts and be an authority on this topic? The problem with that is sometimes you can't really connect with an audience if you don't allow that emotion or that humanity to be expressed. And if there isn't trust already there, then it's difficult to build trust through that. So if you think of how, say, science uh, misinformation spreads on social media, it's often very emotive or the message is tied to a political identity, for example, to quickly establish trust. And you can ask yourself, why does an anecdotal story about a bad vaccination experience, how, why is that more powerful than huge amounts of statistical data? And I think it's because as an individual, I can connect emotionally to the parents in that anecdote. I can infer what their positive intentions are. They're trying to help me avoid what happened to them. I can see in a very tangible way 
there's dangers and that's emotionally triggering and emotionally triggering things are much more powerful because it ties into our more ancient innate forms of language. But there's no reason that we can't communicate about science in that way through performance and story. And if you think about some of the best science communicators, I think they do that. So say David Attenborough, for example, he doesn't just give dry zoological facts over his documentaries. He weaves them into these really incredible stories about survival. He makes the animals seem like they're real characters in, in a narrative and he performs it to us. And I think that's far more engaging and memorable than anything that would just be delivered unemotionally. So I think that's something that we, we can all take on board and apply to different contexts, depending on who the audience is, how much of a connection do we have with them already? Do we need to build a connection? And if so, how do we do that through story, through emotion, through our innate forms of language? Yes. So 100% on, and you presented it in such a concise, compelling way. I just have to say, you mentioned David Attenborough, who I really hadn't followed much until I started watching the documentary about dinosaurs on Apple TV. What he does is an example of what you're suggesting. Like he starts out, for, for those, it's not really a spoiler alert, but he starts out <laughs> with Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? Like yeah. the one dinosaur that if you didn't know any other dinosaurs, you're going to probably know that one. So mm -hmm. it's relatable. And then he goes in and builds a story. And then what I loved is at the end of the segment, he said, for all the science behind what we're talking about, go to, you know, this page. And yeah. so it's not like he's not including it. It's just that he wants to really establish this connection. I always say connect before you communicate. I think you really need to do that to open that channel. Ed, would you like to add your comments? I think Amanda has really covered it all. <laughs> what, what, what I'd like to add is maybe a bit of personal experience mm -hmm. to the mix. I set up back in 2012, Montas um, Science and Arts Festival called Science in the City. I intentionally set it up as a science and arts festival, not as a science festival. One, one to bring the emotive as as aspect, uh, but also to, to bring that entertainment value to, to it. I was told by even the my core team of collaborators that Ed, if 1000 people come to, to this festival, don't be, you know, too, too depressed about it. I had written that 10,000 people were going to come, but when we actually ran the thing, about 12,000 came. <laughs> so that probably is one reason why I kept doing it for the last 10 years. Um, but it, it also shows you that this approach can work. It can also go horribly wrong. You can do artist science and art activity, and it's, it, it is actually will bring you close, it will make your audience even more neat. So arts as well can have a communication problem. If you look at fine arts, there is a certain difficulty in, com in communicating the arts as well, when it comes to certain topics within it, knowledge about it and the movements, the, all of these things, there's technicality in everything. So it's not, it's not really just about using the arts to communicate science more effectively. It's also about having a good art where the artist is happy with communicating the science in, in, in something in a way that the, the, the scientist would be happy about it, but also doing it in a way which is inclusive with the people you're trying to engage with connects and relates to them as well. That is really key. And that example you mentioned is really lovely. Uh, uh, and the approach does work. Like the popularity of this festival keeps growing and growing and we've done things such as an artwork lightest installation called Light Pushes Stuff about quantum physics. So it was using light to represent some um, factors about it. So a, a really interesting fact is, is that actually light, let's say you're some bathing or something, the light is, is actually pushing you. <laughs> so this has expanded to like the solar sails concept in science fiction that we sometimes see that you have a giant, um, sail, the light rays will actually act almost as if as wind and push you through space. And because of the vacuum, you'll just keep accelerating and accelerating. And that is something that actually is being used on earth to improve uh, communication tech technology. We did this light installation and when we told the media about it, we also told them that there were going to be some politicians in an exhibition right nearby. They came, they filmed the politicians because they have to, they're the national broadcaster, but they 
basically we're showing on national TV our, our light station because that's what's connected with these pay people. Uh, and this activity actually then went to Hong Kong, went to Germany. And art can really capture our imagination. Science can do that as well. And it's really about thinking about things in, 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 in this way that connects with people rather than tries to teach them, tries to ed educate them in a way that is, reminds us of maybe our school years when we sat down and listened. Which can I just awesome. quickly add something as well? Cause I, I really liked the light pushes stuff, uh, exhibit. If you look, there's a video on YouTube and it's just a huge installation. You can see it from anywhere in the festival and there's all of these glowing orbs just going up and down. And it really just drew people in. Everybody flocked to that exhibit just to have a go. It's, can I have a torch and, and push the orbs up? And I think what drew people in is like the visual and the, the interaction. And once they got there and they were doing it, then they had the question of, so what does this do? What does this mean? And then they started to ask, but, and, and people could then talk to them about, actually, um, this is all about light and how it pushes stuff. And because we'd started, we'd made that connection. That's when people got intrigued and we could really communicate the science. So it was such a great exhibit. Look it up on YouTube. It's fresh. We're going to have the <laughs> link. We're going to have the link to it. Absolutely. In the show notes. And what you were saying about imagination, and we talked earlier about emotion, it, a whole other dimension of really communicating science for the whole person to the whole person. And, and like you were saying, Amanda, it was an entree to actually asking, well, I can, yeah, now I'm interested in the science. So can you tell me a little bit more about the science? It was just this way of um, presenting in such a relatable, exciting, imaginative way. I want to ask you about COVID and how that's been communicated. I'm particularly interested from your perspectives being outside of the U.S. Obviously, I have my own opinions about how things have been going here. I nevertheless am I'm actually more interested in how you think maybe performance and some of the techniques and strategies and appro approaches and mindsets that you teach can be, and of course, Amanda, you mentioned stories about how this vaccine impacted me. It, it was a negative way and how that's so powerful, but I would love to get your perspectives on how those performance skills that you teach at this uh, STEAM session, STEAM summer school can be applied to public health, for example, and maybe how you've either noticed the application of some of them in this during this pandemic, or maybe noted the absence of some of them as well. Do you want to lead us off? Yeah, sure. So I'll, what I'll say is I think performance skills are really important in times like this, because again, if we don't communicate with emotion, then we're ignoring a very important part of language that members of the public will really relate to and be impacted by. It would be great if we could all be reasonable and rational all the time, but unfortunately the world isn't like that. So we have to accept that and work with it, I think. And I have this analogy, which Ian Rollins from Incredible Oceans gave to me. So I just want to thank him, but it's uh, the elephant and rider analogy. And so basically the rider of the elephant represents our rationality. And we can appeal to that rider with scientific evidence and information, right? But the elephant represents our emotional side. It's much bigger. It's much more powerful. And even though the rider is usually in charge, when that elephant is triggered, if it's frightened by something, if it's angry and it wants to charge, then there's no stopping that elephant, no matter how much reason you apply to it, it is in control. So I think in times of crisis, it's even more important that we appeal to the emotional side of people and deal with their feelings around an issue, whether they're afraid of the pandemic, whether they're lonely, whether they're angry because they feel that their freedoms are being encroached upon. That's the time that they need emotional support, emotional guidance, reassurance, and even inspiration, I think. And we can do that through the arts. I saw a lot of dramas come um, out during the pandemic, which was telling stories about what it's like being a healthcare worker during that time, how much brave, bravery and resilience that takes, or even what it's, what it was like to be a COVID patient or a family member of a vulnerable person and how debilitating it was when you're dealing with all those issues and you're struggling. And then there's people just ignoring the rules. Hmm. I think those depictions really help us see 
the realities of other people and realize these are the issues in our society right now. And if we don't step in and do something or at the very least be empathetic and try to cooperate in the small ways we can, then this is going to be a terrible scenario. So I think it really, the arts really help us explore other people's perspectives, what's going on and bring in that um, emotion of what this means for us. And that helps drive, even when we're emotionally driven through fear or anger or insecurity, we can be driven through passion for others, compassion, um, inspiration, all of those positive things as well. So we can counter that narrative through, through drama and, and the arts. Yes, yes. Ed, do you have comments you'd like to add? Yeah, I, d this is a really complex issue. And I think one which uh, re really needs the science communication world to understand. And I, and I don't think we fully understand it because the problem is, is complex because it, it relates to human behavior and how we interpret messages, understand them and act upon them. There are things we know that works, pre-bunking myths and misinformation and disinformation. So that's the idea that you're a bit, you're proactive, something like the COVID-19 pandemic, it, it was predictable that there'd be a rise in the anti-vaccination move, move, movement because it's such a prevalent and powerful tool. As well, at the same time, there, 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 there was a survey by the Welcome, Welcome Global Report. Mm -hmm. And it, by the end of 2020, worldwide, there was about a 10% increase in trust in science, which when I say this to people, they're usually surprised because most people <laughs> think there's been a decrease. Yeah. And that obviously shows you the world of social media that we live in, the bubbles and how negative messages are, are the misinformation, disinformation, fake news, whatever buzzword you want to use, end up be, be, being more in our news feed than, than, than other ones and give us this impression as well. We, which is why we really need research to understand how people are interpreting these messages, what, what makes us you know, change our behavior, act in certain ways. Malta actually had about a 90, 95% uptake of the vaccine. It was insane. That wasn't because the government of Malta ran a fantastic communications campaign. That's probably based a lot on our culture and that we have a deep trust of doctors and, uh, Malta till the last um, 70 years or so w w was a colony basically, uh, for most of its history. And I, I think that's given us a, if someone tells us to do something, we'll do it, <laughs> even if we don't fully understand <laughs> it. So maybe not for the right reason, but it worked. There were certain things I think the, the politicians did, they wore masks, they, they gave this good example. Uh, and most of the re restrictions were reasonable. Like some weren't like uh, wearing masks when you're in nature, which absolutely doesn't make sense. Th this need for, for research to understand wh what we can do to handle the communication cam campaigns that, that are needed when you've got something like the COVID-19 pandemic, for me are like really essential and key. And coming up with innovative ways, we had this idea of using social science research coupled to artificial intelligence to see which messages would be uh, best suited to achieve certain goals when it came to COVID-19. The problem was finding funding for it because it's much, usually our funders are a bit more technocratic. They want new pills, new medicines, uh, and these sorts of things. And communications is not seen often enough with the great responsibility that it holds of, of essentially something like, like this, it's saving lives. Yes. Yes. Fascinating things to unpack there. I want to ask you, let's start with Amanda. As we start to wrap up, you have been, the program has been around in Malta for about six years, as Ed was saying, and you're, we're right now, as we're talking in the beginning of June of 2020, um, on the cusp of another session. So I first would like to ask you to think back about maybe what has surprised you most, uh, about the folks who have come and the results that have been achieved, maybe besides the fact that a few people got together as couples, uh, <laughs> that maybe wasn't a vision envisioned, uh, important, but maybe not anticipated. And then talk about what's up, what's on tap for this new session. Yeah, great. So yeah, I think 
what surprises me is always just the people are really surprising. We always have such an interesting mix of people and you never really know what's going to come out of them in that creative environment. It might be someone who's really shy initially and then they come out of their shell or it's someone who's very reserved and authoritative um, and doesn't want to open up, but then does and delivers like this really heartfelt poetry or, or even just the hidden talents that people have like music or comedy, or we had someone who had magic skills, just the, these things that you don't expect to come out of people. And even the creative environment itself is always surprising. I think one of my favorite moments of steam happened actually at our, at our, at our last in-person course, and it was before, just before the pa pandemic. And basically the participants had decided on a theater event that explored the big questions for the future. So like, how do we deal with food insecurity, but they were going to allow the audience to choose their own ending. So they might have a sketch say where they're introducing the idea of insect burgers and the audience would vote on whether we should switch to mainly eating in insect burgers or not. And they'd prepared an outcome for each choice. So that when the audience voted, we could see what does the future look like if we made that decision, which was a really cool concept actually, but on the actual night, so everything was going really well. We had a good sized audience. They were all voting and it got to the last sketch, which was more of an ethical dilemma. Um, so you had the director of this eco-friendly company that was having financial problems, but he was interviewing two people for this one job. And one of the people was uh, terrible for the job. They had zero experience, but they had a rich family um, with connections that might be able to bring in some investment that would save the company financially. The second candidate was ideal for the job, loads of experience, but had zero connections. So the question was, does the director hire the right candidate and risk losing the company or the wrong candidate with a better chance of saving the company. So in the sketch, the director says, oh, this is a difficult decision. We're going to pass this on to HR, which was obviously the audience. And the audience voted, the results got projected onto the screen at the back. And everybody who was involved with the event just froze when they saw the results because the results came out as exactly 50-50, <laughs> not even a 0.1% chance on, the other, on either side. So we were all panicking internally because we knew for a fact that nobody had predicted this scenario. Nobody had prepared for this kind of outcome. And we were all looking at this guy playing the director thinking, oh God, what's he going to do with this? So he starts by making a joke like, oh, typical HR, you give them one job and they can't even do that, can't make a decision. Right. And then I think he had some improvised conversation with his secretary who was off stage, who he had this very weird non-professional relationship with. So that was all very entertaining, but you could see that he was just stalling for time. But then eventually he said, you know what, actually, if HR has made this decision, maybe that's just what we should do. We should just hire both of you. So how would you feel about a job share scenario initially? And maybe we could upgrade it to full time in the future. And in a way, that was actually the best outcome because yeah. the company would still have a shot of saving themselves financially, but also do the right thing by hiring the right person. Yeah, it was a win-win. And it was such a great way to end the event. <laughs> In a way that we would never have predicted. Yeah, it's always always surprising. I think it's Steve. <laughs> Brilliant. I love that example. Cool. Ed, what what about you? I I, I don't think I, I can top that example for <laughs> sure. I, I've really enjoyed working with these people because, I, to be honest, what surprised me is that they um, came to the summer school, enjoyed it, and then actually wanted to work with us afterwards. A, and a lot of the times they would come work with us. We've gained interns because of this. Some of the people started working with us in 2016 and they're still working with us. <laughs> they started off driving people around, then actually taking the summer school. And now they're in a position where they're leading parts of it and helping organize it also. So it, I think that really builds my self-confidence, to be honest. I, I come from a tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's not um, some big prestigious university or something of the sort, and we've built up something that other people appreciate and uh, see the quality of, which I think is always the biggest reward. So for me, it what surprised me is that people really connected with it and really uh, wanted to keep working at it and share these values with us and continue 
developing their expertise in science com communication, which uh, was effective, works, and engages human beings, really. Um, yes. Yes. The whole human. I think that's been yeah. a big theme here. <laughs> so Amanda, maybe just as we wrap, give folks who are interested where they can go to register, what they could expect if they would want to take part in this amazing adventure and when it starts and all that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. So the website is steamsummerschool.eu. You can go there to register now. We've currently got an early bird discount. So normally the registration costs 800 euro, but we've reduced it to 700 and it will be like that for another couple of weeks. So you can register through the website. You'll get immediate access, as I say, to our online. So you can start to learn a bit about science communication if you feel like you need to brush up in any of the areas. We also have accommodation that we provide through the school. So we really recommend that accommodation because for one, it's cheaper, but also then you get to stay with your participants um, and really interact with them in the evenings as well through our social events. And we also pick you up and drop you off to all the locations that you need to get to. So you don't have to worry about getting around. And then we do recommend booking your flights as early as possible, but also ensuring those flights just in case something changes and, and you can't attend. But yeah, so everything's there on the website and you can register, as I say, for the early bird discount right now. Yeah, please come register. We'd love to have you. Wonderful. And you get to be on the wonderful island nation of Malta. I think that is really cool. We do have sun sea. That, it, it is really a beautiful place to visit. And the history and culture that's 7,000 years old. So. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, ha we, we do have a good social program, I should say, as well in the evening. Ed does a tour of Valletta, like a historical tour. And we have a science cinema night. We have escape rooms that we go to. And we also go to visit the Blue Lagoon in Camino, which is absolutely stunning. Because everybody needs a break. We definitely love doing our science communication, but we also sometimes need a break as well. <laughs> yes, fantastic. I urge listeners to check it out. Dr. Ed Duca, Amanda Matheson, thank you so much for being on the show with us today and sharing your insights, all the information that you have that you, you know about, of course, STEAM Summer School and the work that goes into that, what people can expect if they want to participate. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having us. I really enjoyed it. Listeners, thank you for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.